In this video, we'll discuss graphing and analyzing data. Now, when we're talking about categorical data, one of the most common ways we will graph it is through a bar graph. The purpose is to depict the relative size of the different categories. We can use vertical or horizontal bars, but they need to be uniform so they're the same width and evenly spaced. The graph should also include, whenever possible, the labels and an appropriate scale of the data. So let's say we have this example where we have 50 kindergarten children that were asked their favorite colors. And we have here in this chart, in our uh, frequency table, red, pink, blue, and green, and their numbers. So if we wanted to turn that into a bar chart, we would put our labels of red, pink, blue, and green at the bottom. We have a vertical axis that would have numbers that would help us to represent the data we have in our table. And in this case, we made it so it's easy to read. So we're skipping every two. And it helps to have it line up with a major or minor axis whenever possible. If that's not possible, the next best thing to do would be to write the value above the bar so that it can be stated accurately. Now, sometimes you'll see this little squiggle near the where the axes come together and this means that data has been condensed so that you can actually look at it better often so whenever you see that just know that it's condensing values somewhere in the graph and it's important to recognize what that does so say that instead of only 50 we were able to uh, do a sample of 400 children at a local school for their colors same four colors but the numbers have changed so if we take these numbers and put them into a bar graph, part of the problem is the bar graph gets really tall. We have to spread out the numbers a lot more. See, they're spread by 20s, and you end up with bars that are in between numbers. So you're now starting to guess if you don't have the table. By using the condensing format here, we could then say instead we're going to start at 75, and now the major axes are able to change to only every five. This allows the four colors to all show up at a major axis, which makes the graph easier to read. Now, it's important to also recognize that when condensed, it also ex uh, enhances that difference between the groups. So sometimes it can make it look greater than it really is. So it's always important to look at the information, look at how the graph is created, and understand what does that mean. Another form that we use for categorical data are pie graphs, or also known as pie charts. The purpose here is to show the relationship between the categories as a whole set. Often, we'll see these written with percentages of the whole sample. If you need to construct one yourself, what you will do is you'll create the category's fraction out of the total, and then multiply it by 360 degrees, and use that angle measure to help you form that slice of the pie. Now, often we use programs like Excel or other sort of spreadsheet programs to help us do that. So it shouldn't be something you should have to do by hand anytime. Now, let's say that we have 60 kindergarten children that were uh, given this random sample back to four colors. And so we have our numbers here of 12, 18, 20, and 10. If we did need to create the degrees, we'd say, well, we know there's 60 total. So we're going to take our number of people that favor red, divide it by the 60 total, and then multiply it by 360 degrees. So we can say that slice of the circle would be 72 degrees. We could do the same thing with pink. We just divide by 60 and then multiply by the 360, and that'd be 108 degrees of the whole circle. The blue would be 120 degrees using the same method, and the green would be 60 degrees. And if I add up all four of those values, they come up to 360 degrees. So when I graph it then, I can see each of my pieces of the pie, and you can see how it's been labeled as well. We have a title here, Favorite Colors of Kindergartners. We have the colors, and here they're marked in such a way to help distinguish in case there are people that are colorblind like myself, so there's something more than just the color to help distinguish the different parts of the pie chart with the percents inside of them. So that can be very helpful. The key here though is that sometimes you're provided only a graph with percents and you may have to use that to go back to uh, how many are in each category. So it's different information provided in different formats. 
Now, one of the most common ways we'll talk about numerical data is through line graphs. These are often going to be created using paired data that's connected by a line that shows how one point changes from other, the, other, the previous point, over a sequence. Most commonly, that sequence is over time. We cannot use this for categorical data. That is important. Most often, we're using it to see how something changes over time, or maybe how it changes over the number of times something is attempted. For example, the US national debt. Say we have a table that has the data from uh, since 1970 to 2010 every five years, and this is in billions of dollars. And we'll see, well, what is the data doing? So creating the line graph more than just plotting the points helps to see what does that growth look like? And you can see that it starts to have a little bit of a curve to it, not just a linear growth to it. And that could allow for other types of analysis of the data based on what we're seeing in this situation. Now, let's talk about the idea of analysis. Most often, we're looking at three ways you may have to do graphical analysis. First, maybe just to read the data. You're going to be given a graph of some sort, and you're going to pull exact information from the graph. That's the easiest type of analysis you may have to do. The next type would have to be to read between the data. Here, there's some form of comparison or contrasting the different parts of the graph. How much more, how much less did this group do than the other? How much has it changed over time? Those types of questions can be used as part of analysis. The third type is to read beyond the data, where we're extrapolating the information to help us understand a broader picture. Maybe we're trying to make a prediction of the future based on what we see happening in the graph. Or maybe we're trying to understand the larger population based on the little bit of information we have. But we're using what we have in the graph to understand something at a broader perspective. So let's look at some examples. Here we have a pie chart that shows the monthly expenses of a family. So here would be one question that could be asked that goes with the reading the data. What category represents about one-fourth of the family's total expenses? Now the key here is understanding what is one-fourth because that's a fraction and these are all in percents. So we need to say, okay, one-fourth is about 25%. So we're looking for what category is close to 25%. Of all the categories, this one right here is at 24%. That's the closest we can get. So we've got these little squiggly lines, and we look over on our key, and we see that that represents daycare. So daycare at 24% is about one-fourth of the family's total expenses. Now the question is, what category is just over three times more than the food expenses? So here we're trying to compare between the groups. So we're reading between the data. So we find first find the food. So food is the one that has bricks. And so that's this 14%. So we're saying three times more than 14% is about 42%. And this says just over three times. So we're saying what's just over 42%? Well, the only one that's even close is this 44%. And using our key, we see that that is rent. So rent is about three times more than the amount they're spending on food. So let's look at a question that look beyond. If we know that the car expenses were $150 each month, then what is the total amount of expenses that the family is spending each month? So we're using this car expense here, which is the vertical lines, the 6%, to understand what does that mean about the larger expenses this family has. So how could we do that? Well, if we relate the percent of the cars to the 100% of the entire expenses, we could say that that is the car expense to the total expenses they have. So we look and say, well, what do we have? Do we have the car expense or the car percent? Yeah, it's 6%. Do we have the amount we're spending on cars each month? Yes, it's $150. So we have three of the four pieces of information we can then solve for the total expenses. So 6% out of 100% equals 150 out of X. We can cross multiply here, and this will give us 6X equals $15,000. So if we divide both sides by six, we'd say that their monthly budget is $2,500. 
And so using that, we could calculate every other category to see how much is being spent per category each month. Now let's look at a bar graph example. So here we have a bar graph of a store that's made sales in a month at four different locations. And we know how much did they sell in Mapleton for the month. So Mapleton comes to this gray line right here. I can follow that over and say, well, that is a minor tick mark, but it's in between 140 and 160. So that's exactly 150. But the thing is, that's not $150 that they made in sales because the sales are in thousands of dollars. So I need to take this amount and multiply it by 1,000. So really, Mapleton sold $150,000 in sales in a month. Now say maybe we want a between question. How much more did the store make in sales at Chester compared to Greytown? Well, we can start by looking at Chester and say it sold 200. And Greytown sold 80. And remember, these are in thousands of dollars. So 200 minus 80 is 120, which means since that's in thousands of dollars, the store made 120,000 more dollars in sales at Chester than in Greytown. Now let's look at a beyond question. Say that based on these monthly sales, how much should the store earn in sales for a year at Branson? So this is just one month, but we want to know an entire year. So we have to think about, okay, what would that mean in this case? So one month is 120 and a year is really 12 months. So I can look at the sales of one month compared to the sales of 12 months and just assume it's going to be about the same. So let's plug in what we know. We do know the sales for one month is 120 in thousands of dollars. So I'm solving for the sales for the 12 months. Here I'm going to multiply both sides by 12 months. So I know that my months will cancel here, leave me just with my amount. And my 12 months to 12 months will simplify to one, leave me just with the sales equal to the $1,440, but that's in thousands of dollars. So to get the total sales for the year, I need to take this amount and multiply by a thousand. Again, this is in thousands of dollars. So really the store will earn $1,440,000 in sales over the year in Branson.